Sunday of Lent, and we are focusing on uh, walking to Jerusalem with Jesus, who's turned his face there. Our theme for the season is Rend Your Hearts and Claim the Promise. The first part of this theme is Rend Your Heart comes from uh, Prophet Joel and Isaiah. Several prophets use this phrase because when one discovered their their sin or their travesty would tear their clothes. Um, when Jesus was before the Sanhedrin uh, and uh, he announced that he was the Messiah, uh, Caiaphas, the chief priest, tore his clothes, rendered his garments the sign of, of, of great distress and great sorrow. And so as we, as, as the prophet said, we rend our hearts, not our garments, we, we're checking out the fabric of the heart as the place to understand our sensitivity toward or insensitivity toward the things that are special to us like God. Claim the promise is looking at this season, having already discovered that Jesus did go to Jerusalem, he was executed, he was resurrected, and so he gives us promises that we can claim that if we are uh, if we pick up our cross daily, if we if we walk in his shadow, we walk in his light, we walk in his shoes, the promise is that he is with us. God is with us. We are not alone. And so we combine these two for this wonderful season. While I'm thinking of it, uh, John, the hymn is on number 25 in the hymnal, if you Oh, oh, I, I already looked it up. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, the music of God of Worship is 197. Thank you. But so I couldn't, I couldn't find the uh, anthem, though. Okay. Thank, thank you, David. <laughs> thank you, John. Last week, we uh, began our year-long theme of renovation, of keeping the faith in downtown Provo. We remain very positive uh, that God has called us to this wonderful ministry uh, and God has assembled a wonderful team of persons who are leading us in this. We had a great launch last week. My thanks to all who made that possible, especially to Kenna and Isaac and David and Betty Ann. And we had some wonderful response. Should you be interested in responding, uh, you See us at the website. There's a there's a pristine website, Keeping the Faith in Downtown Provo. Is that correct, David? Keeping the Faith Provo. Keeping the Faith Provo. Thank you. That you may go and learn more about this wonderful ministry. Let me see. Call your attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin. And always inviting people to come to the Interfaith Choir, which meets. Sunday afternoons beginning at 4.50, 10 minutes before 5, and always includes supper. Tonight happens to be spaghetti and meat to balls. Um, so come and be a part of that. Oh yes, and, and garlic bread. Don't want to forget that. Let me see. Are there other announcements or other sentiments that need to be lifted up today? Okay, then for those who are present and have the bulletin, let us turn to the gathering. Again, the theme, Rend Your Hearts, Claim the Promise Today, is Walk Before Me. God seems to care about names. In the conversation with Abram, God renames him, and then God renames Sarai too. As with the creation of the man and woman on day six, Sarah is a part of the covenant too. When we enter into covenantal relationship with Christ Jesus, we take on a new identity in Christ. Today we ask, how do we walk before God in the name we have been given? David, remind us to ask Jesus to keep us near the cross.
that you turn to our congregational call to worship if you're new to our tradition. And should you wish, there is a bold, dark print you are invited to speak audibly the words, the response. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent towards the one who calls each by a new name. As disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, pulling our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. As believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us. For the promise of God to creation is that God has put flesh and blood as the good news called Jesus. As people from all walks of life, we have two things in common. First, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And secondly, we have a Savior who specializes in forgiveness. Come, let us name our sins in the sure and certain hope of forgiveness. And Lord, join us at the altar as we pray together, saying, Lord, we have not always lived within the righteousness of our repentance. Having come into the light, we choose the presence of darkness and evil. Having been forgiven, we choose to imprison ourselves with fear and distrust. Having been robed in righteousness, we gladly have reached for the clothes of sloth and slant. The humble and contrite hearts, we, we repent and seek forgiveness and restoration. restoration. Amen. Amen. The good news is that Christ calls us to new life and enables us to begin again and again and again. So dear friends, put regret behind you and walk in the joy of the Lord. For I tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thank you. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Pause just a moment here. We call ourselves to order, and then, in case some impediment has taken us out of the light and by choice has put us at enmity with God, we need, should we want to approach God, to cleanse ourselves. We got all that odor on us. And so we do. Forgiveness is announced and it's meant. However the words of the confession approached, was it sloth, was it slander, was it fear, was it distrust, it is now relieved, you've forgiven me. And in turn, you chose to forgive me, announce the words of forgiveness to me. And now in this forgiven state, we can approach the throne of heaven and grace even more confidently, even more fully, even more reasonably. Our hymn, is, O oh God, our help in ages past, I invite you to remain seated as we sing.
And now, our Lord, as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, grant us with joy that we may hear what you have for us today. For we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Got some mucus hanging on my throat and it is driving my senses crazy. Hopefully it will pass sooner than later. Walk before me. We start out at the point of saying, Jesus, I will follow. Jesus comes around, comes, comes to our boats. We're there mending our nets. We're there sorting the catch. The end of a shift. And Jesus looks at us and he says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of humankind. Amazingly, he's got to believe. A couple boats down, Jesus stops, says the same thing to another two fishermen. Now they just happen to be cousins with the first two fishermen. Just come and follow me. Matthew, a tax collector, gets the invitation by Jesus to come and follow me. And he, we suppose, left being a tax collector and wandered the countryside with Jesus. Some of John the baptizer's disciples were told by John that Jesus was the Messiah. He pointed and says, there goes the Messiah. And they went over and they talked to Jesus. And he said, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, come and follow. He said, come and see. And they followed. And they saw. And they stayed. So we're used to thinking of following in the footsteps of Jesus. We're used to thinking of following in the footsteps of greatness. I stand in this pulpit, recognizing all the pastors for the last 130 years who have brought the Word of God to this congregation in this place. Now, this sanctuary was built in 1950, in the 50s. Before that, it was the sanctuary over there. Just go out the door and go up the stairs. And before that, it was a house. But the Word was proclaimed. I stand in their place. I stand in the shoes of greatness. I'm following greatness. And there will be, by God willing, someone who will follow me. When I was in college, fortunate to be a collegiate athlete, it just so happened that the person's place who I took happened to have been a three-year starter, happened to have been widely claimed as one of the best to ever play the sport in that conference, at that position. I'm getting ready to play the first game. My position coach comes up and grabs me and says, you got, you got a great number, play up to it. Flip over my heels. By the way, it's number 60 for those who care. But number one in your heart. We're used to thinking. We follow in the footsteps of it. We follow in the shadow. God has always seen us out there leading us, leading us to glory, leading us into a life that represents the kingdom of heaven. Matter of fact, it's so important to us that we have added into what Jesus taught was the Lord's Prayer. We have added into that over the millennia, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. So important. In all three of the synoptic gospels, Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is all about you. Now is the time. It's happening now. We've been thinking it's going to come and overshadow us and like rain and etc. Et but it's Jesus, it's arrived. And one of the fascinating things that he constantly seems to have been saying is, what do you mean you can't see it? 
kingdom of heaven look like? Basically, it looks like persons who love God with their hearts on land and strength and love their neighbors and love themselves. On these two hang all the interpretations of the law of Christ. And as we begin to break that open, we begin to see. When Jesus announces his ministry in the Gospel of Luke in Nazareth, he quotes Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, covering sight to the blind, set at liberty to those who believe, to acclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee year. That will happen all the time. Not just every 50 years. That's the sign. Can you see it? The leaders of Israel came to see Jesus. Are you the Messiah? They said, he said, well, what do you see me doing? Are those not the signs? Are those not the personality characteristics? Are not those the behavior characteristics that says this is God's work? Because we can describe what God's work isn't by the same definition. If God's work is to love the inner, to, to love the neighbor as we love ourselves, and we ask the question, who is the neighbor? And Jesus' response is, let me tell you a story, and you tell me who was neighborly, and when you define neighborly out of that story, that's who the neighbor is. Now, the easy answer is everyone. The more difficult answer is, it even includes those we don't like. Because we all know how we like to be treated. And once we know how we like to be treated, we are not to treat someone else, anyone else, everyone else, as we like to be treated. If we do that, kingdom of God stuff, light, heaven, all that. Don't do that, kingdom of hell. Stay in a place where God does not exist. However it is pulled together. We can make any excuse that we want to, but it all comes down and is dependent on those characteristics. And so, we got our eye on Jesus. Did he do it? As far as we know, the answer is yes. Greater love hath no one than to lay down their life for another. Think about it. Did Jesus do it? Over and over and over again. In today's gospel reading, since in the gospel of Mark, chapter 8, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Peter rebukes him. He takes him aside and rebukes him. We're not said, told what the rebuke was. Did Peter rebuke him and say, Lord, don't say that because you're going to frighten all the disciples away because we've got to go with you, and what's going to ever happen to you is going to happen to us? Is that part of the rebuke? He's taking care of himself. He's only been walking in the territory of Jesus for about two and a half years, two, two three, quarter years. Did he not know this? Did he not see this? Had he not experienced it and, and had to make decisions over and over and over again that to follow Jesus was the privilege and joy of understanding fully the kingdom? Do we not understand that darkness is going to try to overcome the light? Do we not over, to understand that, that self-love is going to seek to overcome selfless love? The temptations are always about us. To turn off the lights because the party's on. God said, let's turn on the light. As a matter of fact, let's be the light and go to the darkest places. Offer to them what God has offered to us. Forgiveness, redemption, salvation, acceptance. Is 
that what his rebuke was of Jesus? Or was his rebuke of Jesus something else? Lord, you're saying all this stuff. And you're scaring us over this, but not only might leave you because we don't want to go to Jerusalem and die with you, but we don't want you to go to Jerusalem and die. You're too important. Was that the rebuke? Some of my really good friends want me to answer that question for you. I wish I could. I can get within the quadrant, but Mark doesn't really tell us what his rebuke was. But I know how I rebuked Jesus. Do you know how you rebuked Jesus? Any time that I say, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm rebuking Jesus. I'm calling him a liar. Now some of us would say that that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's calling God a liar. So however, I might think about how I could rebuke Jesus. I know how to rebuke you. And one of the ways that I rebuke you is saying, you're stupid. Now I guarantee you, I don't like to be called stupid. So if I don't like to be called stupid, why do I get to call you stupid? Oh, my goodness gracious, I'm walking in the darkness. I'm treating you the way I don't like to be treated. Jesus does not answer Peter directly. He gets all the disciples around, and now he's going to answer Peter directly by answering and talking to them. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Oh, my goodness gracious, that's got to be a joyous day. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You are setting your mind on things that protect you, and you are unwilling to believe the full promises of God. Jesus' world at Jesus' time, that meant that Peter, for rebuking him, for standing in his way, for saying, oh, over my dead body are, we, are you getting to go? For whatever reason Peter was saying that, Peter was taking the side of the darkness. Satan. He called the crowd with his disciples and said, if anyone wants to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The cross is the mission. The cross is the life. The cross is the behavior. The cross is figuring out how to love the enemy, how to turn the cheek when struck, how to go the second mile. Why do we have to figure it out? I guess because it's just not natural to us. And even after we say, okay, it's going to become natural to me, I don't know that it ever does. just kind of get there. And most of the time, we're picking up that cross and carrying it, and some of the times, we're not picking it up at all, or we're laying it down. And if we're laying it down, it's just as if we're rebuking Jesus. get a new name to match our behaviors and our mirrors. Satan, someone who stands in opposition, or our Christian name that celebrates the image of God with it. Today you get the answer. You're carrying that cross. Because with it are going to come some really good perks, and with it are going to come some really harsh perks. Like suffering, rejection, and ridicule. I've had the privilege of serving for over 50 years. And all through those 50 years, the evidence has been overwhelming that there is growing segment of this country that has and wants nothing to do with 
with Christianity, organized religion. Is this the time that they can they can ridicule us to such an extent that we give up the ghost? I guess we'll see. So part of that, we pick that one, we pick that part of the cross up. For anyone who wants to lose their life, excuse me, for anyone who wants to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. we saved from darkness, evil, new consideration, dispassion, hell. What are we saved to? Redemption, forgiveness, mercy, grace. Now that other side, they got those same words. Why get so confusing? At least it does for me. But those words, redemption, mercy, grace, and forgiveness, has to do with towing that line. Has nothing to do with treating others the way we like to be treated. Matter of fact, that line is treat them as unimportant because you're the most important thing. Hasty generalization, maybe he's got some truth in it, hope so. To lose our life, to gain our life, is to put on Christ, a new life. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? What does it profit them? They gain the world. What do they not have? Something called the peace of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the redemption of God. Knowing that they can, they can either specifically or generally confess their sin, and there's a whole group of, of people who will say, you're forgiven. There are a couple of political figures around the country today who've been exposed. It's nothing new. It happens all the time. But part of that exposure is more and more and more the voices are saying, you can't be forgiven. We won't forgive you. And by the way, you didn't even say you were sorry, which is irrelevant because we're not going to forgive you anyway. Because you hold a different political view than we think is right. What do we profit? We gain the whole world. We lose our life. We gain the world. The world just doesn't seem to care. We talk about humanity, we talk about sensitivity, we talk about openness, we talk about diversity, and then we start defining our terms, and they don't always mean what they seem to mean. And so Jesus says, in following me, just a few verses before he says, who do people say that I am? And Peter spoke up, Simon spoke up and said, you are the Messiah. And he says, okay, your name is no longer Simon, your name is now Peter. Your name is no longer Satan, your name is now Righteous. Peter also, of course, as you know, means rock. That's why it's so fascinating in such a short period of time. Days, in fact, according to Mark's Gospel, he loses his name. He gets a new name. So as we follow in the footsteps of Christ, when we are ready to recognize it, we're not only following Christ, but we got people following us and they're walking in our footsteps, thinking they're walking in Christ's footsteps, and that's really important. Really important. In the Genesis chapter today, Genesis 17, Abram is 99 years old. It's been 25 years since his first conversation with God, and God is, again, stating the covenant. This is the third in the story of Abraham. This is the third repetition of the covenant with Abraham. In the first, Abraham lost his home. What did he gain? Wandering. 
In the second, he lost his security. What did he gain? Security. And here he is in the third, and he loses his name. What does he gain? A new name, a new identity. We rather focus on what he's gaining, but he also includes what he lost. Suggestion here is without an acknowledgement of sacrifice, we run the risk of misrepresenting the call. Yes, there are promises to plan, but there is a necessary remedy in order to claim the promises. So Abram literally means exalted father. Is it possible that God was saying, thank you very much, I'll be the exalted one, you just be the father of many? Oh, that's what Abraham means. So he gives up exalted father, which has godly overtones, and you shall have no other God before me, but that's another sermon. And he gains that identity of father of many. Okay. Sarai, his wife, she, she told she was going to have children and their descendants were going to be so many. And here, that was 25 years ago, and now it's 25 years later, and she's still barren. Cursed. How was she and how was Abraham able to believe after so long a period of time? Anyway. Sarah literally means contentious and quarrelsome. Wonderful point was made in Sunday school. She probably got that way after Ishmael was born. But she couldn't have any children. She decided she would have children through Hagar. It's a wonderful story. Or maybe she was just always that way. But it seemed to have gotten worse since the birth of Ishmael. No matter. New name, new identity, Sarah. Meaning princess. Shakespeare wrote The Taming of the Truth, and one of my favorite renditions of that is with uh, Bert. No, uh, thank you, Richard Burton and. Uh, uh, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Keep at it. Don't, don't call me Lord. That's blasphemy. <laughs> And in the movie, this she you know, the shrew is just a shrew. and then she turns and has this wonderfully pivotal moment, so beautifully displayed. She who couldn't couldn't resist embarrassing her husband, and he he bets the farm that's, that that he managed to change her, and by God, she comes in and offers this wonderfully, in my opinion, redemptive speech. Oh. Hope you agree that if not, we can talk. But here's Sarah, contentious, quarrelsome, a shrew who becomes princess. Was that directly related to the fact that she finally got pregnant? Could be. But what's important is the understanding of the new identities. We used to say, back when I was a kid, what's your Christian name? We thought we were really going to put something over on someone. And that's the name that someone is baptized with. Well, it just so happens that my Christian name is the same as my secular name, my birth name. Because that's what the church I was baptized in did. But we used to think we had some attachment to the mystery. Because once you said your Christian name, then people could depend on the fact that we were going to be Christian. However we understood the term. And so here, God is saying, when you repent and are forgiven, you put on Christianity. When you choose to sin and rationalize, you take it off. I wear this robe and these vestments as a sign of putting on 
the power and strength of the gospel. This represents my privilege to do it by the denominations that are made. Happens all over Christianity. And when we put on the new identity, we leave the old one behind, but it's always trying to get back in and take over. 24 years into the journey with God, Abraham and Sarah are still in the dark, still waiting for fulfillment, and yet they choose to honor the covenant. They choose to live in the newness of God. And they are choosing to walk with God. And then it seems that this is where the fascinating part of the story takes place. God says, walk before me. Why? God can keep his eye on us. Now, a lot of us think that, oh, Lord, here comes the criticism. Oh, this is, oh, my goodness gracious. Could be that. But it could be so that I can help you achieve what you say you want to achieve. The way I look at it is, is they used to take video practices and games, and then we'd watch the, the tape, and sure enough, you did good, you did good, oh my goodness gracious, look at that. Seeing is worth a thousand words, I suppose, and then the coach would say, we can fix it. We can't see it, we can't fix it. It's stuck with That's the way I view this. You've got saying, walk before me. I can see what you cannot see. I know what you want to accomplish, and I can help you do it. The next question is, will you let me? It takes humility to say, I need some help. It takes courage to say, thank you for helping me. Thank you for following me so that I can follow you who can follow me. Somehow that seems to work. When we arrive at this time and this place, to ask not so much about tomorrow, and not spend a lot of time talking about yesterday, but to ask today, this time, this place, where do we want to be? Reluctantly walking to Jerusalem? Talking behind Jesus' back because we don't like what he's doing and what he's saying? He'll repeat this. All of some question him. Only say, which way is it going to be? We're walking faith towards Jerusalem, not really particularly caring whether we get great accolades and are sent, uh, uh, taken to the throne or whether we end up destroyed. We're going not for what we're going to get, we're going because of what has happened to us and what we can give. We may not call it rebuke, but we'll get rebuke. We'll get called up and said, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's where we are on this Sunday in Lent. As we lend our hearts, as we claim the promise, and as we say to Almighty God, walk before me. Excuse me. We will walk before you so that we may receive your So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for calling us together. Thank you, Lord, for giving us new identities in you and this country. Light and promise and covenant. Holiness, repentance, mercy. 
Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for loving the world. That you who gave yourself for us invite us to give ourselves for others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen, David. Joys and concerns. Do you have any this morning that you would share? I'm glad Betty Ann is back with us. Thank you, Fred. I'm glad to be back. Well, she had to conjure up this thing called uh, AFib. What was that other one? Um, something about heart. Oh, yeah, whatever it was. Something you know, to get a break. So thank, thank, thank the doctor for giving you inspiration to come back. Excuse. God, we thank you for the written witnesses, excuse me, the written witness of our ancestors in the scripture. We thank you for the living witness as you have given us your word for us to ponder and wrestle with this day. For you are the God who loves us so much that you call us into more and more clarity. Thank you for being, Lord, someone who hears us and sees us and listens and understands, understands our situation, our strengths, our limitations giving us your inspiration, your answer, in a way that we can receive it, benefit it, and grow it. Thank you for the privilege and the confidence that you give us to offer our prayers before you. We pray. As the saints have taught, we pray for our leaders and all in authority. In our countries, in our counties, in our cities, in our companies, and other institutions. We pray for this congregation. But also we pray for all who seek wisdom and seek knowledge and seek inspiration from you. We pray for all leaders of the church. We pray for deacons and pastors and elders, bishops, presidents, all oh, servants and ministers. We pray for the earth and everything that lives and moves and supports life upon it, and for all who work to sustain it. We pray for our families, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, and our enemies. We pray for all who need your healing, delivering, and saving power in their life, especially us who think we have a good portion of it. It's not so much, Lord, replenish that which we have given away. We just acknowledge that in whatever state that we are in, not only our gratitude, but in our need and humility for healing, delivering, and saving power. In other words, Lord, Lord, point out where we can do better. We pray for the students that matriculate in the universities in and around Provo, especially at Brigham Young University. Thank you, Lord, for sending us students who could go anywhere to meet requirements of their courses, but come here. We celebrate with Betty Ann. Thank you, Lord, for bringing her some healing. And whether it be shocking her heart back in the rhythm or a pacemaker or just the medicines that she's taking, Lord, thank you for the miracle of her health and her healing. 
We pray for the Interfaith Choir, which meets here in the afternoon. We thank you for the launching of Keep the Faith in Downtown Provo. And we thank you for those who are interested and those who are pondering your nudges, Lord, of how to serve you as we accomplish this great vision that you have given us. There are other names, other situations to us, Lord, that we have chosen not to share, but are deeply important to us personally. And so in this moment, we pause to talk to you from my heart to yours. Trust me that you will hear our prayer. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you for loving us and for claiming us. Lord, as you bless Sarah and Abraham, you have also invited us into the blessing of connection within the family of humanity whom you continue to bless. We give to you our lives. trusting that they will be a fragrant offering in celebration of the depths of our blessing, praying that our, the blessing you have given unto us will become a blessing to strengthen the church across the world. Thank you. You are the Christ, you are our Savior, and you are the Redeemer. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your greatest answer, we are bold to pray the prayer which he himself taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us in the time of trial, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you.